what does it mean to deserve such fortunes as hush puppies? What type of work is commensurate with the riches of private jets and $5,000 handbags? The billionaire Gucci master had his answers to these questions, but so too did the FBI. Answers that will form the basis of United States of America versus Ramon Oluruno Abbas, the criminal case filed against him in a California federal court. Just three days after his dinner with Daddy Freeze, the US government has alleged Abbas found another reason to celebrate. According to the federal indictment on him and his alleged co conspirator, on October 15, 2019, a Chase Bank account Abbas controlled in the US received a wire transfer for $922,857.76. Sent by a New York firm, the money was meant to be a payment owed to one of its clients, who refinanced a piece of real estate at Citizens Bank. When a paralegal at the firm, identified only as KC, emailed to confirm where the wire should be sent, she received a fax telling her to direct the payment to Chase instead. KC called a phone number on the fax to confirm the details, and when everything seemed to match up, he initiated the transfer. In truth, everything did not match up. The fax and phone call had not come from Casey's client, but according to court documents, from someone in the orbit of a bus, perhaps a bus himself, who'd inserted himself in the middle of the transaction. The gambit was part of what was known as Business Email Compromise, or BEC attack. It's a lucrative, worried and elusive scam the government claims Abbas and his co-conspirators have executed around the world. BEC scams are increasingly common and exceedingly difficult to stop. From the Chase account, more than a third of the money was wired to an account at the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. The rest was moved to different bank accounts. On 17th October 2019, Abbas allegedly sent an image of the $396,000 transfer to a Canadian-American from Toronto named Galeb Alomari, who authorities say was his partner in various bc like scams. The government says that Alomari, Abbas, and a loose online confederation of other figures a group that at times included North Korean state-sponsored hackers targeted hundreds of millions of dollars in payouts from businesses and banks, including more than $100 million from a single Premier League soccer club. Alomari messaged a third person to check that the money had arrived in Canada. When the transfer was confirmed, he messaged Abbas again. Alomari promised one. He was on a plane that had just landed, he said, and he'd send the image as soon as he had a strong enough signal. But the confirmation never came. Moments later, the FBI approached Alomari at the airport and placed him under arrest. Federal investigators are searching for suspects in an internet fraud case that nearly anyone who's received a suspicious email will recognize. Successful BEC scams, such as the ones Alomari and Abbas stand accused of, always come off like a bit of a magic trick. Fill in accounting, or KC the paralegal, in the Abbas case, receives an invoice, logs it into a payment system, and sends off what seems like a routine payment. And then, poof, the money is gone, 
unhesitatingly seemingly evaporated en route to its intended destination. The client of Casey's farm did notice the money was missing until later in October. BEC attacks started appearing roughly half a dozen years ago, escalating each year until they surpassed all forms of internet fraud. And so business email compromise, just very quickly, is when an attacker is pretending to be you. According to FBI reports, there were almost 20,000 such scams against American businesses in 2020 alone, accounting for $1.8 billion in losses. Though the variety of BEC crimes can make totals hard to pin down. Crane Hassold, the senior director of threat research at the cyber defense company Agari Data Inc. and a former FBI analyst, likes to define a BEC as a response-based impersonation attack that's requesting something of value. Basically, posing as a legitimate business to trick people into giving away their money. So business email compromise is a cyber threat that's been around for about five, six years now, um, has become increasingly common. And essentially what it is, um, it started out as uh, es essentially an impersonation style attack where a cyber criminal would simply email uh, an employee at a company, usually an accounts payable specialist, or maybe even the CFO, uh, pretending and looking like they are an executive at a company, someone like a CEO. Uh, requesting a wire transfer to a supposed vendor um, that needs to be paid for an overdue payment. That sort of morphed over the past couple of years into a number of other types of, of attacks. No matter the flavor, a BEC scam generally begins with someone hacking into a corporate email account, often using social engineering tactics like phishing. Once inside, the perpetrators don't steal anything not at first. Instead, they quietly begin forwarding copies of incoming and outgoing email to themselves. They will wait. They watch it for a number of weeks or months, looking for details of certain payments that are going out, understanding who their customers are, looking at communication patterns. When they spot an invoice coming in or out, they use that intelligence to insert themselves into an actual payment that is supposed to be due. From there, the scam can work two ways. If the scammers have compromised the emails of the intended recipient of the payment, they simply create an invoice identical to the real one, swapping in their own bank account details and resend it from the recipient's mail, often with apologies for the mix-up. If, on the other hand, they've compromised the sender, they might send a follow-up invoice from a spoofed email that appears at first glance to match the payees or even create an entire company and website, one letter off from the real one. In either case, Phil in accounting sees an email that, without careful scrutiny, matches the ones he receives every day. To the rest of us, it can seem absurd that a corporate employee could send millions of dollars to the wrong bank account. But these attacks are so realistic looking most people don't give it a second thought. Because when you're involved in payments like this, you see a lot of these emails every single day. And when it doesn't raise any red flags, you're not going to go up the chain and do any confirmation. One will expect that when you get into larger and larger amounts of money that are exchanging hands, that there will be some process that requires secondary authorization or something like that. But in many cases, that's not what actually happens. Here is an overview of how a BEC scam works. First off, the crooks hack company A, often using phishing or another form of social engineering. They study the rhythms of its transactions, then wait for it to send an invoice. Then company A sends an invoice to company B. When the invoice is sent, the attackers send an email from company's A address, changing the banking details to an account that they control. After the scammers receive the wire transfer from company B, the money is divided up and sent overseas.
Meanwhile, among the scammers, there tends to exist a hierarchy of loosely networked players, most of whom take a small cut of the total funds. There are those who are expert at breaking into email accounts in the first place. We'll call them hackers. However, they might not actually do any technical hacking to get in. Then we have the money mules. These are often locals who've been tricked into opening bank accounts through romance scams and other rosses. Above them are what we call loaders, and the law calls them money launderers. These are the people who control international bank accounts that accept millions of dollars in transfers and then reroute the money around the world to be harvested by heist organizers. According to the FBI, BEC scams cause more losses than any form of internet fraud. The scams account for 40% of the cybercrime take in the US. However, they retain a strangely low profile. Only the largest cases tend to break out of the tech and security press. This is partly because BCs are humiliating for corporate victims. What New York law firm wants to risk its clients' trusts, after all, by disclosing that it unwittingly paid millions of dollars to a random fraudster overseas? Despite the money in play, the crime can seem technical and pedestrian compared with the high sex drama of holding a hospital or gas pipeline cyber hostage for ransom. Most people think of BEC attacks as just basic boring attacks, and as a result, they don't think it's a big problem. However, it is actually a big problem. When you look at the amount of money that is actually lost to ransomware, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's lost in a BEC attack. BECs are now a worldwide phenomenon, with networked online gangs springing up everywhere from the US to Russia to Brazil. But while the scam's origins are unclear, the cybersecurity industry broadly assumes it began in Nigeria because many perpetrators have been traced there. A lot of the same concepts that go into these BEC attacks, criminals and scammers in West Africa have been doing it for decades. The scams from West Africa are all individually targeted social engineering attacks. And essentially, what happened was that in around 2015, cyber criminals started seeing that they could make more money targeting businesses than they could targeting individuals.